that's going to be held at the uh, Sea English Academy in Schaumburg, across the Renaissance Center. And I believe the class is going to be there every two weeks, but they'll cover uh, a variety of different types of social media things. There will be beginners, intermediates, and more experts also. And last thing to pick up over here is something that we've uh, trademarked and we call the Digital Dominance Index. And it's a methodology to essentially determine what your digital presence is. And it's pretty effective and it's quite interesting if you're looking to use some different types of social media. So I'd encourage everybody, although I don't keep a very tidy table, to pick one of these up. So, with that, I'd like to give an introduction to tonight's speaker. Uh, Chuck Scherenberg is the Director of Chicago Operations for Kaizen Consulting. He has more than 20 years experience as a business advisor, executive coach, supported hundreds of business owners with the processes, structures, and systems to grow and develop their staff and businesses. He's worked with companies across many sectors, including technology, manufacturing, distribution, healthcare, financial services, and real estate. Speaker and facilitator, Chuck presents Kaizen Business Growth Strategies, if I'm saying that right, at conference and corporate events. His topic today is fundamental business structures for ensuring success in your business. Join me in welcoming, welcoming Chuck. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight. I know there's all sorts of other events going on especially I was conscious of a competitor of sorts, and that would be the President of the United States, who would likely to talk about manufacturing in one way or another tonight. <laughs> so uh, with that out of the way, I appreciate having all of you give your introductions ahead of time so that now I know the audience is very diverse, which I appreciate for this. Um, we are going to talk about manufacturers, and the topic is going to apply to all businesses. But just to get us started and get us focused, a little bit, I would like to ask a question of all of you from your different perspectives. What is the most challenging issue for manufacturers in the Midwest right now? What is the greatest challenge? Not enough business. Not enough business. Foreign competition. Foreign competition. Cash flow. <laughs> Well, uh, my clients would agree with you. In fact, uh, I would hear cash flow from them in about three different ways, or uh, bottom line money. You know, so cash flow is indeed what um, connects the sales. Because if you don't have enough sales, you don't have enough cash flow. So, uh, if you will, that's my starting point tonight. And if we're interested in improving cash flow, one way that we can improve cash flow is to improve sales. And if this was a sales presentation, that's what I would talk about. <clears throat> but what I'm finding from my clients is that some of them are actually starting to get a few more sales. What's also happening for them is the cost of running their business is increasing even faster. So as a result, they're more willing to talk to me about their operation and most specifically about how they can reduce their costs. So, with that in mind, tonight I want to talk about three things. How fundamental structures in general, but specifically how the organization chart can serve as a basis for enabling organizations to be successful. Second, I want to talk about the kind of answers that the organization chart can provide with regard to the locale, the functions, the industries, and the sector's reach of human companies. <coughs> and lastly, I want to talk about how the organizational, organizational chart provides the foundation for helping companies get stronger without necessarily purchasing more equipment. So that's where we're going with this tonight. Um, when we're talking about manufacturing, there's a lot of examples that bring in the terms brick and mortar. And through the years, it's taken a lot of brick and mortar to get the right product to the right customer in the right location at the right time for the best price. And 
in doing that, when we talk about the brick and mortar, the <clears throat> bricks, to me, are the fundamental structures. And the fundamental structures include the chain of supply, <coughs> the flow of operations, the procedures that support those operations, and the organization chart. So if those are the bricks, the mortar are the people that make it go. Actually, I like to say the people are the ones that hold it together. So, from experience, we're finding out that people that don't pay a lot of attention to the people that hold it together, these are the organizations that do have trouble. And, um, if you will, the bricks start to wobble because the people chip off. You know? Contrary to that, the people that pay attention to the people that hold things together, these are the people that can allow an organization to grow strong without necessarily purchasing more equipment. So, with these good things in mind, happily I've got a few examples. I've had the honor and privilege of working with a manufacturing company that's also a distributor to clients worldwide over five years now. And they've had some success stories because they paid attention to the fundamental structures including the organization chart. So this one supervisor is saying, it made me a better supervisor. Productivity increased by 20%, and in my one-on-one -on -one meetings, people were more engaged. So he's having a good time. The next man told me that they had 40% improvement in the efficiency in their particular systems. And he feels so relieved because he was able to get through the roadblocks. And finally, another example, this man had a 65 to 70 percent improvement in efficiency. And even though they're still short on personnel, they were able to still get the job done. They're working to move as a team instead of functioning like a fire department. And now he can actually tell his people to do some things the right way. So a few success stories to mention. Um, what I'm thinking would be useful now is uh, first to talk about organization charts and how I use them in my business. You know, the organization chart um, is the map of the organization. With an organization chart, we know where people are at and how they relate to other people. So that's the good news. The bad news is that it doesn't necessarily map over to the flow of operations. So when I go into an organization to work, I typically have to start with the flow of operations. So this is a template that I use to find out what's going on in the organization. In large organizations, there is a map over from the organization chart to uh, the flow of operations, typically. In small organizations, not so much. So I do ask for documentation. And when there are documentation, I ask for checklists. But if you will, we start here, so I've got some information to fill in these blanks. Because as you can see, there's a variety of different ways that you can approach this. You can approach it by product. You can approach it by the different um, operating systems within the organization, marketing, operations, finance, HR research and development. When I have that, my job is to map the organization chart over onto the flow of operations. And a way that we can do that is with a grid. Now this is a rather simple grid, especially for some of you that are experts in uh, the kind of work that you do. But let's just use this as an example. So in the first column, you can see that we've mapped over the different titles from the organization chart and place them next to different jobs that the company is producing. And in this particular situation, we're looking at the different categories of people and the number of hours that could, that they would be working to fulfill a particular job. And this then becomes my talking tool. Now we all have different talking tools. 
because we're talking about organization charts and mapping it over to find flow of operation, this works for me to ask, help me ask questions deeper than I might normally ask questions. Because remember, the clients that I'm working with and a lot of other people in the room are working with, these are people that are sometimes working seven, nine, seven days a week, sometimes 10 hour days. So many people have heard me say this before, they're down in the trees and the weeds, and my job is to bring them up 30,000 feet before the, above the business so that they can see the patterns and the opportunities. So to a large extent, I'm the guy that asks a heck of a lot of questions. So some of the questions that come to mind, and Lori can do about four of those, we'll do a lot of ones. <clears throat> what are the functions required? What would the optimum flow of operations be? How many staffing hours are required? And are there workers time conflict? Now this was developed for a particular situation where it made sense. But my idea tonight was to share with you some questions that would give you an example of what I do, but also give you some ideas that you might want to use in your own business. To do that, I thought we might go through a bit of an exercise that's painless. <coughs> I'd like you to think of a firm, and because we have non-manufacturers here, please think of any kind of firm that uh, you're associated with. But the idea is to have a particular organization in mind, and think about the organization chart that goes with that organization, if you happen to know about the flow of operations as well, fine. But at least have something in mind as I go through some examples. These questions that I'm using tonight are called debrief questions. And we first deal with the facts. And there's enough people in this room that might have seen the reruns on television of an old, old, old program called Dragnet. And there it was just the facts, right? So you heard at the beginning of every program, it was a warm day in Los Angeles. Frank was my partner. We're working homicide. We're at the corner of Hollywood and Vine, and the alarm goes off. That would be an example of facts. So particular example I want to give tonight is uh, it's the Gizmo organization. They're in Arlington Heights. They've been in business for 22 years. They have uh, income of um, $2 million a year and they have 25 employees. They produce about 150 Gizmos a day. So those are the facts. Tell me about your organizations. What facts would be examples from your particular organizations that I might not have thought of that would be real important for us to know. Did you say number of employees, Jeff? 25 employees at the Gizmos. What do they sell a Gizmo for and what does it cost them to make? Oh, all good questions, yes. They, um, it's $350 a Gizmo. And as far as their, um, their expenses, it's about half of that. How and long does it take them to make each gizmo? <clears throat> well, they're able to produce 150 a day with their 25 employees, and I didn't get that particular <clears throat> statistic out of there. But let us say that right now, we've got a base of operations to move forward from, and we don't want to get too far into the weeds, just enough to to get the idea of the flavor of the organization. And I suppose I could have a pretty picture of their plant up here, right? But uh, we're going to use our imaginations. What's their demand? What's their demand? Yeah. Well, I'm going to, that's a great segue to the next question. <laughs> so this is their accomplishments. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Smile, Hal. All right. So right now, yeah, um, the Gizmo organization, <coughs> they've been able to stay in business for 22 years at a profit. And the reason that they've got a profit is they have continued to acquire more and more customers for their gizmos. So that's an accomplishment. Now we want to, you know, that's a big, big accomplishment in my book. So we'd like to have the small accomplishments as well. Uh, something that comes to mind is they have been very conscientious about computerizing. They are highly mechanized. And in fact, they've been able to stay state of the art. That's the reason they're able to stay profitable. So um, some of the smaller things I'll deal with in the next question. Uh, but for right now, let's 
talk about your organizations, what's coming to mind that you'd want to, you know, if, <clears throat> if you're trying to get your organization stronger, it's real important to have some of these facts. So what would you capture for your organization that we could all benefit from? All your strengths. All the strengths. What would be, how would you talk about that as an accomplishment? How it relates to the success. What's the tie-in? All right, well, uh, that reminds me of one for the gizmos. And that is one of their accomplishments is they've had a really stable workforce. 22 years, they've got people that have been working there 15, 17 years. So that would be another accomplishment. Since we're talking about HR, Lord, does anything come to mind that we ought to make sure we include as far as accomplishments or here keep up? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, my question would be, what, what were the weaknesses or the mistakes? We're going to get you, there. And what did you learn from that? Okay. So perhaps we could have that as the accomplishments. They made some mistakes and they learned from those mistakes in such a way that they were able to take advantage of it. Great. Yes. Well, what differentiates them from their competition? That would be another thing. If, in other words, to keep this demand up, there's got to be something that differentiates them. It turns out that they make left-handed gizmos as well as right-handed gizmos. It works for them. Nobody else does left-handed ones. Business something else that you want to strengths. How long are they retaining their customers? Or is this business growth all churn? Yeah. Is that makes a big difference in the model? So if you will, when we're doing any kind of planning, it really think it really pays to have our facts in order. All of these good things are the kinds of things that I would pull together before I went into any kind of retreat with the leadership. <laughs> right now we're going to what worked. So what worked is having this stable workforce. Um, and being able to learn from mistakes could come in this category as well. Uh, something that came to my mind that's apropos of this group is they were able to use a bunch of good consultants. If you know what I mean. Yeah. I was, I was let's say, HR, Six Sigma, Kaizen. It was just, that all came to mind for some reason. <laughs> yeah. Do they have a statistical monitoring system for products out and rejection? Yes, they do. So they actually know what they so, got to do to get their... So because of their, uh, their skill at staying computerized, they have all of this uh, computerized information database. So those are things that work. So it's also very necessary to identify what didn't work. In this particular organization, one of the challenges they're having right now is that uh, three people have retired and two people have moved on to another organization. And so they've actually been able to hire folks they haven't been able to train. So training is an issue for them. It's not working. They used up all the money on the consultants already, so they're <laughs> So I'm really looking to liven up this conversation with other things that come to mind from other organizations. Did the people who leave, did they actually write up everything they did so somebody could walk into their specific camp? Oh, because we're here, no, no way. That's one of the things I was talking about. It was all in their head. Because when you say three people left, five people left. Five, I mean, five people left. Yeah. You have no way to know what they did or how they did it or how they thought. And now you're they stuck. hired me after the fact. You know, I would have gotten it all down for them, but it's gone. So what I hear is none of their processes are documented. That's right. And potentially, if some of those were non-exempt workers, there's overtime and building and things like yeah. that because of it. Those, do employees know that they're, I mean, what are their, do they know what their expectations are? I mean, if they can't be trained. As I come in the door, there's a lot of things that I still have to gather as a consultant coming in the door. What I'm hearing from the owners is we got big problems here. The new folks don't know what they're doing. And it ain't us that's causing the problem. They're just, they just don't know. They're just the new generation, you know what I mean? So 
there are these challenges going on, but those would be examples of things that we would want to get information about before we move on can to you, the next. Um, can you talk okay. to the people that left? That would be something that I would want to garner under my assignment as far as, as the process, yes. We can talk to the retired folks. I'm not sure about the other ones. When, when it could, I, I'd probe more on that than that they don't think they're the cause. Yeah. Well, I'm finding you to be great colleagues to be in the room with me when I'm interviewing the owners of the company to gather this information that I don't already have. So we're coming up with a lot of good questions. And I see that this is where we're going to put the energy for the rest of this exercise is the questions that need to be asked here to get the information down so we can do a good job. Okay, so the next thing is what is missing? And I love this question because it's a drill down question. You can use anything from the previous questions, you know, like what was missing and so forth. Excuse me, what wasn't working? But it was like, what was missing that that wasn't working? So uh, if we've got people that can't do their job, what was missing was the training. And what was missing that the training was missing? Well, the procedures and the policies from the previous folks that walked out the door. What was missing that that was missing? Well, it turns out that these particular owners are great people down in the trees and the weeds. They do real well with the computers and getting everything up. As far as planning is how they're going to keep the workforce active for the next 20 years, they're not so good at that. So that's what's missing. So uh, we could probably talk about this for a lot longer out. Do they have a mission statement? I mean, do they have any idea what they're well, trying to Well, you know, as I come in the door, they'd like me to work on that with them. Make the best gizmo. What's that? The mission is to make the best gizmo in yeah. the world. Well, this is a 22-year-old. It was similar, you know, it was an easier time so they were able to get by without a clear mission statement. You may have said, this, this is, a, is this a family run business? It is. <laughs> and if they looked at the process of continuing into, you know, family succession and those benefits. Right now, these are pre-retirement folks, and the reason I'm coming in the door is because they're beginning to think about how they're going to support themselves in retirement. And that will drive them to do some of the things that we might like them to do. The question being, do they have an exit strategy, or is it given that they don't? Is it more like they woke up one day and said, okay, what do I do now? And they don't know how they fell into what it. What are the initials for, oh my God? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of those that, um, uh, oops, the economy's where it is and I want to retire in five years. And sometimes, it, what I'm hearing from this particular family, it's not the guy that wants to retire. It's his wife. She's told him. He's retiring. So he's retiring. <laughs> well, not yet. <laughs> he's got things to do. She expects the money. All right. <laughs> All right. So this next question is opportunities. And this is really a brainstorming question. And because by this point, because of all your good help with me, we've got a bigger database than where we started out. Now we can do more work than the regular brainstorming process. We can go several different places, and uh, wasn't sure exactly how this would work tonight, so this is what I'm talking about. We can now start looking at the current organization chart and seeing where the holes are or where the duplication is. We can start looking at the flow of the operations and seeing the same thing. In light of that, we might want to reevaluate the geographical, industrial, or sector reach of the organization. Uh, there's a number of organizations I think we've all worked with. They could actually make a bigger profit if they focused on a particular niche. So that's something that we can look at. In light of where they're at right now and where they want to go, perhaps grooming the organization <coughs> itself, it might be that they've got, uh, if they just focus on the left-handed folks, they might have a much more, uh, a better cash flow and a better margin. Higher price. The idea is that if we have these things in mind, we can look at what the future organization chart would look like. 
Now, in hardier days, I could say, you know, it's a lot easier to double or triple the size of your business than it is to grow it by 5 to 10% a year. Because the idea is some of your existing systems are going to break after a while. So come in the back door and do that. What I like to say now is, let's make your organization stronger. So look at the different large corporations that have, in fact, scaled back so that they could focus on their core strength. So this organization may want to do that. In light of that, how might they simplify the, the future organization chart? But the idea is to start with the future organization chart and work backwards. So bear with me with the example of the double or triple the size. At Kaizen, we sometimes deal with organizations and say, you know, you grew this organization from nothing. And right now, it's at least 10 times where you started. So let's start there and see what the organization chart would look like. And then we step back to five times, and then two and a half times the size of the organization. Well, by then, it's less of a challenge. And we can start playing with what it would look like. But if we've got somebody, in this case, in this not so strong economy, saying that we want to double the size of the business, and we look at what that would look like, it's a lot easier to see what it would look like if it was only 50% larger than if we started the other way around. So we might go through the conversation about what would a strong organization look like? And what would the different functions be that would be going on there? And then, Al? You keep talking people, but I'm thinking a lot of companies are getting automated instead of drawing and drafting, now they have CAD CAM. When you look at that organizationally, the better functions, do you look at what they got? Do they have the right software? Do they got the right process? Do they got the right machinery, tooling, whatever they have in place to get a product out? How do you put that in the organization chart? Because that could be a replacement. That really may involved in the flow of operations. You know, you've got all the mechanics that are going on, and who's managing the mechanics? Uh, so it, it's there, Al, and it, it's, with all due respect, it's saying it's there, we're going to use it. It's just that in this economy, rather than uh, expanding or spending more money on the equipment, what changes can we do with the existing staff in light of the things, in light of those holes we found? The things, the information that wasn't there, or the, the opportunities that people were not taking advantage of. Thoughtful questions. Yes. I just think I think uh, this exercise also helps to identify <coughs> the the capability gaps of the existing workforce and where you want yes. to be in the future, yes. and how you like specifically look at the optimization chart and how how and what's your plan to fulfill those kind of gaps in the development the people or the more new skills. Well, uh, one of the opportunities here is to recruit what we call in Kaizen eight players. Now, eight players are people that are doing, they're performing at the top 10% of their particular <coughs> job description or their particular function. <coughs> and they're doing that in their organization and they either have high potential to help the organization as it transforms or medium opportunities to grow, uh, to take out new tasks as the organization transforms. Or the third level of an eight player is that they're doing a really great job where they're at. Then we talk about B players. And these are players that are the next 25% down. So it would be between 90 and 65%. And these are the people that are doing a good job at that level. And the first group are people that, and in their current particular job. And somehow, maybe moving them to a different spot would allow them to be an A player in this new organization. So we can work with them. The other would be a B player in that they're not capable of doing that, and they're able to do a good job where they're at. Not a superior job, but a good job. And then we also address C players, and I won't go into that right now. But the idea is to be able to clarify the opportunities within the workforce that can address both the current organization chart and the future work chart. Oh. It's just one question. One yeah. thing that I see is missing here is which is after the transition plan. Would you say a lot around this thing? Sorry, uh, one thing I see missing here on this slide after the transition plan 
in my opinion, is going to be a reevaluation of whatever the plan that you put in place and monitor the, the progress that you're making um, according to the plan. Well, if you will, we haven't gotten there yet. Um, we've got the, the transition plan. What you're saying is that you would like to see an evaluation component below this? Right. All right. Right. Um, I absolutely agree with you. And my perspective is that that would be included in the transition plan. It's kind of like you, you evaluate, you plan, you implement, and you evaluate. Sure. So this is a juncture where we start looking at what are the insights that we gain from going through this kind of exercise. <clears throat> and some of the things that you're bringing up are an example of that. You know, maybe we want to break some of these factors out. I worked with one organization, and we had these uh, fabulous criteria for uh, competencies, for leadership. And this was the, the most complete list I'd ever seen. I was really impressed with it. And then I go to work for one of their subsidiaries. Huh. It needed to be customized for their particular thing. This was a um, telecom company. And they were dealing with several states. Well, all of a sudden, you got into a market in Indiana. They had probably one of the most diverse customer populations and one of the most diverse workforces. And they said, huh, where's diversity? You don't have diversity on you. And the first one that was developed um, under communication, it totally neglected all of the online communication. That needs to be a skill set that everybody has to have today. But isn't it in your marketing and research to define who your true customer is and what the market is? Even if you're going to put a plant, you want to know what diversity is around there for yeah. the type of plant. Because well, you'll go to certain areas based on that diversity. My point is that we are going to get insights as we continue to grow. Something that was fabulous um, in a given circumstance is all of a sudden not going to meet the needs. And therefore, you would acknowledge this and move on. Um, where they had spent a whole lot of time getting core competencies that could relate to a 360 degree instrument. They could be involved in the evaluations and everybody was so glad that they got this much commonality the folks that were underneath that said, it didn't go to work for us. So that would be an example of an insight. And because of this conversation, we're coming up with all sorts of things that we as a group would be asking the owners, what about this? What about that? What about the other thing? And um, in the privacy of this room, we get to ask the questions, uh, kind of like, why not? But with that, we went to say, what might cause you to have talk this way? <laughs> Right. Normally, I do the, the next steps after we do the brainstorming. In this type of room, I switched it around to do the insights first because we needed the insights before we could come up with the action items. So here, it would be all the things that you're talking about, Al. You know, if we've got this kind of situation, what are the action items going to be? And so here we could identify those things that would give us the most leverage first. Uh, give us the best payback is the way I like to say it. For themselves as individuals, themselves as leaders, and for their business. Then the key there becomes how do you get them to actually confront the real situation? Are you taking little steps toward it? Or when you're consulting, because I've done it with staffing, they're in deep doo-doo, but they're never going to look at it as deep doo-doo. They're going to think they're doing marvelous. You can't just tell them how bad they are right away. You've got to kind of show them. That's always been my belief. So they start really confronting the issue. Because you're right, they're sitting in the weeds and the grass. You're sitting at 30,000 feet going, oh my god. How do you, that's why when your actions take, how do you, how do you get their buying? I use that word. Well, we can show them the flow of operations and what the flow of operations requires. Um, let's see what's next. Um, what, one of the things that came, came out of this is looking at accountabilities. The, what we're finding is that there's a whole lot of power in focus on mapping the accountabilities of the managers and the staff to the flow of operations. 
So as opposed to, um, Al, I would say we would look at options and present the options and you present the option you want in the middle and see what they do with it. But at the very least, we can talk about the eight players that I just mentioned and see how they would fit into these kind of accountabilities. Um, I've been having great luck with a 360 degree evaluation called the Denison. And that Denison uh, will identify high strengths and low strengths. So it turns out that it's an easier, it's digestible as to where people are at. Uh, but what we, we can at least present these accountabilities to people to say, this is, if you include these and you map them to the flow of operation, you're likely to get better results. How might we do that in your particular organization? <clears throat> Who are the best candidates? Now we do the, the same kind of a, um, accountability with the staff. And the idea is, uh, I think I want to go on to the next slide. Um, if you will, that kind of conversation begets more questions. What kind of structure do we need to support these people that we want to take on more development? What kind of crossover training do we need? What overlay do I need? What systems will allow for this? And so if I talk that way, it's less personal, and people are likely to digest it a little bit better than if we're talking about personalities. Um, here's performance uh, expectations. Now this is where we're getting into the values, the mission, and the vision of the organization as to what's important. Again, I have a privilege of working with this organization that's a logistics supply company. And I've worked for them under a number of leaders. And I'm real impressed with the guy I'm working for right now, who does a director's guidance at the beginning of every fiscal year. <coughs> and he gets better every year. What he's doing is identifying specific goals for the organization and measurements for success that drill down, they're, they're available to the whole organization. And the idea of the managers is to connect the dots between the individual worker, their individual work unit, themselves, all the way up to the senior level. That would work. Um, so here we're looking at the given organization, let's you know we're still working with the gizmos, as to what their goals are, and what would the measures be for success, and how would we relate that to the different people in the organization. So this is another thing where we could have a really lively discussion and put it all down here because of the good work we did already. I would rather focus on the development piece, so we're going to move on to the next slide. Here it's the same questions, but the idea is that if you have the performance goals, how are we going to get there with our existing staff? So that gets into the professional development goals. And so we've got the same questions. What goals need to be accomplished and how are we going to measure those things? And so for that, I've got a little more uh, things to talk about. The next slide. I use the, the cash for cash model, KSH for CASH. And the K stands for knowledge. So like what kind of knowledge to, let's talk about me. I'm going to be the CEO of the company. What kind of knowledge do I have to acquire to be the CEO of the business? What kind of attitudes? And you know, to make the cash work, we had to do a little fuzzy with the language. But uh, we're really talking about values. And with a number of organizations, uh, we need to be more efficient and we need to talk about customer satisfaction rather than customer service. Because we could do everything under the sun to give service. What they really need is satisfaction on points one, two, and three. So it's establishing those kinds of values under the attitude. The skills are experience. Not only do I have to have the knowledge, but I've had to have been in the field for a little while in order to do this job. And then the work habits. Um, some of you might have heard the stories about people that uh, are now retired from General Motors 
and they're now working for Kia down in, I think it's South Carolina. And they need different work habits. <laughs> You've heard about this, right? Well, one of the work habits is lunch pails at GM, everybody has their own lunch bucket, right? Not so at Kia. You all bring your food and you share. Tools, at GM, we kept the tools in a toolbox. At Kia, you put them out on a flat surface and there's a mark for where you put a particular tool. Everything in its place. So if you will, that would be an example of changing work habits that might have to go on to fit our revised organization structure that we're going for this new company. Um, so if you will, it would be looking at these things and it could be that I'm going to get the biggest bang for the buck by focusing on more experience. Well fine, let me make a smart goal. I will be successful by June 5th when I uh, acquire this experience. I will know that I'm successful when I'm able to manage this particular production and this particular machine. I can measure those things. So getting that specific would allow us to map over the accountabilities of the manager and the staff to the flow of operations. Questions? say that that's the indicator of a great presentation. If you don't have questions, oh. you are going to answer them because of your participatory nature. All right. So why do you find that most people don't define SMART goals? I mean, you and I have been talking about that for three years. And your question is, why don't they define SMART goals? Yeah, why don't they define or what? what's the... A, a SMART goal to me, it seems kind of um, self-evident, but yet people either fail to make SMART goals or if they do, they fail to succeed in executing them. Which one is it and what's the biggest reason for failure? What is it? What's a SMART goal? Uh, a, a SMART goal, if we put these words down the side of the page again, the S stands for specific. The more specific you can make a goal, the better. The M is measurable. We've got to be able to measure the results out in the field. The A is it can be attainable amidst your busy schedule. And I'll come back to answer your question in a minute, Frank. The R is that it's relevant. And relevant to me is that there's some payback for you as a person, as a leader, and for your business here. And T is it's time specific. And to answer your question, Fred, I think people are so time challenged. And we think that what we're doing is so small that we don't have to give it its full value. <coughs> and so we go along without using the tool. So because people don't value their time, they don't set the SMART goal. They just kind of... Well, it, it's kind of like, I know in my mind what the goal is. Let's go get it. Okay. They get busy doing yeah. instead of... And if we're going to involve the... Uh, if we're going to delegate things, we really have to do a project plan. The better we do a project plan, the more people will understand what we're talking about. And by gosh, we ought to have some measures in there for what success is going to be. How I was trained is people are like Navy SEALs. You just drop them in anywhere. They got their mission accomplished. But they have no idea what the hell they did, but they will do it because that's how. And then people operate companies that way, the same way. You just drop them in and they get a company. They have no idea. They don't even know to look for a goal because they don't. They just do it and then they go, what did I just do? They have no, don't even look back. That's well, how it was explained you know, to me. In different economies, you could do it that way. What's happening now is some of our competition is using these different methods. And if we're getting, um, what happens for me is I work with a lot of people that are technical experts. They really know their own skill. But they don't have a particular training like this. And the idea is just one of these tools, if they start using it, is going to make a landmark difference for their particular company. Yes? I think a lot of times this is also um, the leaders of the company, they don't have constant communication with their staff on their specific, like, small goals. Yeah. So that they're not monitoring, they can create opportunities for those people to develop. 
Yeah. So some of this can be a personal style, and that's what I was getting in with the owners of the Gizmo Company. They had real skills in uh, being down in the production every day. And I, we might have all had clients like this. I have a different client who will not do strategy to save his soul. <laughs> will not go there. And so better they develop a team that somehow has an inkling of looking beyond their nose. So if you will, that's what this presentation has been about. It's been looking at a couple of tools that provide an opportunity for conversation that get us to look beyond our nose. And by looking around beyond our nose, we can see how that tool can overlap on the production that we're so dearly love. So tonight, I um, wanted to make three points. That it's the people that hold the business manufacturing process and structures together. And that it's the empowered people that can improve the fundamental structures in such a way that we can have strong <coughs> businesses without finding more equipment. And the key for success is working with accountabilities for the managers and staff in such a way that they're able to match with the flow of operations. All of this gets back to our bottom line of a positive cash flow when we started out that improves the bottom line. So that's what it's all about, and that's what's going to allow us to fulfill our goals and commitments in life by working with these good people. So thank you for your kind attention tonight. <laughs> okay, folks, so that concludes the presentation for this evening. Please feel free to mingle. We've still got the room for a while. Do some networking and enjoy yourselves. Thanks for coming out. <laughs>